tonight and show everybody Batman. Oh, hello everyone. Hey, Batman, say hello. What a Batman's honey. 12 weeks. Hey, this guy. Oh my gosh. 12 weeks. <laughs> what a sweetheart. Well, thank you, John, so much for being on the podcast. We'll go ahead and get ready if you're ready. Oh, well, I'm ready. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast. I'm your host, Kayla Bradham, here today with NFL veteran John Austin, term filmmaker. John, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate you and your Batman coming on. <laughs> and there's one more running around the house somewhere, right? Yeah, just know if she's in there. She's a sweetheart, too. All right, well, if we hear dogs barking, we know why, and complete forgiveness for beautiful dogs. John, as we get started, I want to ask you about your football career, but that's not where I want to focus. I want to, I want to talk about life after football, but just to get our, our listeners caught up, how did you get started in football, and, and tell us what your draft selection looked like. Oh, man, um, <clears throat> that was an interesting one because I didn't play football until uh, high school. Um, you know, I moved from a small town called Pastor, Louisiana to Shreveport, Louisiana for high school. And uh, I just started playing football to, you know, um, make friends, meet new people, you know, at uh, Loyola College Prep down there. And uh, I thought it was, it was wound up being a great way to actually do what I wanted to do. But then it turns out I was actually pretty athletic and uh, started to really love the game. We had a bunch of my sophomore year, we had a really strong um, senior group. And the leadership was outstanding. Um, we had just, it, it was one of the first times I really felt that, that beautiful synergy that happens when you have great leadership and people playing their roles to the best that they can. And um, I think that we went to the state semifinals that year. We had like, I don't know, like nine or 10 shutouts on defense that year. Um, our running back, Jonathan Simo, was, was a great guy, uh, rest in peace. Um, he actually won All-State Offensive MVP over Eli Manning that year. Uh, yeah, I know. It was, it was wild. We, had a, we just had a really wonderful team. And so from there, I just kind of took what some of those, that, uh, some of those seniors taught me and just kind of kept riding with it, you know, and playing with heart and things like that. And um, I had seen Stanford when I was like 12 years old. Um, my cousin, um, who Batman here, a.k.a. Bruce Wayne, is partly named after, um, showed me the university and I fell in love with it. And then uh, my junior year in high school, I saw that Stanford had a football camp and over that summer. And, you know, my mother pushed me to go uh, and uh, God bless her for that. And I earned a scholarship offer from Tyrone Willingham within a month. You know, I did really well. My grades were already good. So, you know, once I checked my grades, I, I had a scholarship offer. Stanford was there. And then, uh, you know, we had a tough time right before, um, right before, uh, Hardball came in there, you know, we were in a little bit of a weird phase. My first year, we were really good. And then after that, Tyrone left and we weren't great for so long. And then uh, I got moved to rush in versus playing linebacker, but uh, wound up, I think I'm still top 10 in career sacks over there at Stanford. Um, and, you know, I had set a couple of records, things of that nature, but uh, that was great. And then I think, you know, come draft time, um, you know, I did really well at the combine. I had a good college career. I was drafted 77th overall uh, to the Raiders. I mean, not, not to the Raiders, but to the Rams at the time, uh, which was wild because they had all these picks. And it was like, they drafted me in a position where they were stacked. Right? You had, you know, Tiso, Tiso Moa, uh, Pisa, Tino Isamoa, who was a phenomenal linebacker, and Dexter Copley backing him up. And I was the will backing both of those guys up. And so I didn't play much right my first year. Uh, I wanted to be in the second year, um, doing all that the NFL pieces back over. And I got picked by the Raiders, which was great. It was like today. I needed my family. I was there for three years. Um, and that was great, you know. Um, and, I, you know, I love being in the Bay Area. I love the Raiders. And that was, that was a really great time. And then I signed a two-year deal with Tampa, but I retired because of concussions um, that that year. So I played five years and then got to the jump in the pool. And... John, that last year, what, what was it? Did you have four concussions your last season? Well, in a full calendar year, it was yeah. a lot. I had two with the Raiders and then two with the, the Bucks, and I was like, yeah, this is too many. Yeah. And, you know, so with the Sports Philanthropy Network, we do a lot of work with um, concussions. And I, I guess, you know, just sharing your experience and, and talking to so many other athletes do you still have complications from the concussions or has that sort of dissipated over time? 
No, I mean, you know, when you're dealing with concussions, it's one of those things where it's a, a, a um, I would say, a path of discovery over time, you know, because you don't really know what to expect on the other side of, um, you know, temporal low damage, you know, frontal, like, frontal low damage and things of that nature. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to talk with other athletes on their journeys and, and, and things of that nature. I, I got into running after football a lot, you know, um, I really got into that to kind of like breathe, if that makes sense, you know, that keeping that bit of exercise, it's really good for, for things. I started to do a lot of like regenerative uh, exercises, fish oils, a lot of things to try to deal with that. But my attention span is a little bit here and there sometimes, but, um, you know, concussions are never an easy thing for anyone, you know, um, but now that we're having a lot more of the discussions about it and, and how, to, how to deal with it, I think it's a, we're, we're taking steps in the right direction. So as we sort of transition out of football, I guess I do want to back up for just one question and ask if you have any advice to young athletes, high school, college kids or their coaches, as far as player safety goes, what would your message be to those young athletes and coaches? Um, you know, I think they're doing a lot of things with the rules of the game as far as player safety is concerned. Um, you know, I think in practice, maybe getting rid of some of those um, old school rah-rah drills, you know, um, like Oklahoma drills and things like that. You don't, need, you, you don't need that sort of specific downhill contact to prove anything to be good at football. You know what I mean? I think those kinds of things. I think if, if I go back to the NFL, if any a lot of the injuries that I had that I'm still, you know, dealing with, like even in college, I messed up my knee in a one-on-one drill, you know, once, and then my back is still hurting from a silly one-on-one drill that we were doing with the, the fullbacks or something like that. And those are, I, I just, I don't, I didn't have a whole lot of physical injuries in the sport. So to, to look at those two places and say, these are lingering injuries that I have just from not live practice or, or live, live games, but these stupid drills, you know, I said, okay, all right, we got to cut these out for safety. Thank you. Thank you for that message. Again, my name is Kayla Brown. I'm here with John Alston on the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast, and we are sponsored by Stables Media. And John, I want to talk to you about the amazing things that you have done after those four injuries, after you decided to hang up your cleats. You went into filmmaking. Did you always have a passion for film? Yeah, I would say because, you know, I, I kind of grew up as an only kid in, in, in Basel, Louisiana, and it's a really small town. Like I said, we didn't even have a TV, right? Like, because they, they, the, 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 the church is there, is, you can't have it. We're one of those towns, right? It's like, like, like a footloose. And, um, you know, t- movies, you know, I would stay up all, the, all night watching movies, like, you know, TNT and USA. And what I got to learn from all that, I was like, to see a world that was larger, you know, between books and, and film. And so when I got to college, um, I started to study dramatic writing early on and um, public policy and dramatic writing. And then, you know, it took a while to have the courage to really pursue that until after I was done with ball. Um, but once I, I finished, I jumped in. But yeah, that, that passion was always there. So you leave football, you go, you further your education, mm-hmm. and you just get started. Tell us about what that experience was like. What is the first thing that you worked on? Oh, man. I mean, you know, it's interesting. In my the off season of 2010, before my last year, I took a, a course in New York at uh, New York Film Academy um, for a month on directing. And I kind of felt like I had a knack for it. You know, it was like, I really enjoyed it. It's great. And then uh, I got a camera. I got two cameras. I started to do photography just to study the image and this, things of this nature. And then, you know, I had my last season with Tampa and I moved back to New York. And by that summer, I started working on my own feature, my first feature film. And uh, that was, I thought it was going to be easy because I, I had done like some commercials and small things here. Um, and, and, and it was hard. It was a very, very difficult process, but it was worth it. I mean, we wrote scripts. We got a really great cast of people. We had a Tony Award winner in there. You know, we had uh, Lawrence Mason, whom I love, uh, Diego Mercado, who was amazing, you know, but uh, Christina Van uh, and, and, you know, Wilson Herodia was the uh, Tony Award winner there. I thought he did a 
I'm with Dr. as well. And, you know, just being on set with um, that cast and those people believing in me, it felt like sport again in a way, right? You know, as a director and as a producer, you're like a coach or a GM. And then also, you know, just for people to have put the effort in that they did, you know, and I love those guys mm-hmm. to this day. So I spent about three years finishing that film and post and then, you know, with the internet and most international and so iTunes and stuff like that. And then, um, just kept going, you know, just kept going after that. And then going back to school, writing more and then, then coming out to LA and then seeing more success. And so, you know, you're looking at starting to see the culmination of about 10 years worth of work right now. And right now you're working on a film or you finished up a film called Augustus, correct? Correct. So Augustus was a short film that um, originally was brought to me by a uh, writer and, 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 and an actor, Ayende Howe, who I worked with when I, on a, a short film that I did at USC. And um, there were some great ideas in that, in the script, and we had to rework it to make sure that we could shoot it and structure it properly and really hone it, you know what I mean? But we did, and then we put together a really great crew. Uh, with, uh, Quinn Curry, our producer, did a great job. We put together a really great team. Um, I see the for Matt Edwards is doing something with uh, 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 Malcolm Lee right now on Amazon, and he's already done a number of television shows. He's a Stanford USC guy as well. Um, and it just kind of all came together. And then, you know, this was like February of 2019 when, when we started it. And, uh, you know, at this journey now, we've gone to the festival circuit mostly. We've won a number of awards. We've still got some great things on the horizons with it. And, uh, you know, we are um, in the process of running our Oscars campaign for We want more and more people to see the film. I think that's fabulous. And Augustus has a central theme based around social justice, right? Correct. You know, um, as we're dealing with current current events and we're dealing with, um, you know, past events as well and and the abolitionist movement, the the, the movie really speaks about um, or speaks to the age of individual activism that we are living in currently. Um, And when we're talking about social justice, I think that you know, we have to look at ourselves and understand that we are responsible for the world around us and to be active in local politics as much as we are trying to be active in federal uh, elections and politics. And um, we saw, we saw, especially this summer, like the power when people themselves don't wait for leadership to tell them what to do. You know, you just take to the streets and get things done. And, and, and you see that that cause actually, I, I think that really, really 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 aided the um voter turnout in this year's uh federal elections as well you know which is all you know historical bumps uh, and i don't think it was just because of mail-in voting i think it was also because of awareness right so john i don't want you to give augustus away i want everybody to go watch it but tell us a little bit about the story i know you and i talked about it before the show i, I think everybody would love to hear yeah, I mean, I've got this, you know, it's a, it's a short film, it's beautifully shot, uh, great story, like we said, um, but it, it just, it, it tells the story of an escaped slave, Augustus, uh, living in um, pre-Civil War, Massachusetts, guy, he can read, you know, he's got a family, he's got, uh, you know, a wife and two kids that he wants to provide for, um, and, you know, he has a friend at work, Henry, and they have different points of view on how they will provide for their families, how they will live their lives. They're both escaped slaves masquerading as free men. And, you know, one day at work, uh, after work, they, re- they didn't receive their pay, right? And Henry's point is, look, we've got to be thankful for even having the opportunity here. Augustus is saying, hey, look, you know, we did the work. Why should we not be paid? when these other men over here who don't do the work that we do are receiving their money? Is it because of the color of their skin? Is this okay? And, you know, most, uh, a number of, you know, in the midst of him having this debate and having to go home and tell his wife that he feels emasculated because he can't bring home money, he's having dreams of events that we dealt with today. You know, he dreams of um, the Trayvon Martin killing, but it's not Trayvon Martin that he witnesses his dying, it's his own son. Uh, he has a dream of the Sandra Bland death, and it's not Sandra Blankenstein, it's his wife. So it's a personal, it's a personal, it's a personal journey that wakes him up to speaking out to his for the first time, and then it's revealed at the end who we're actually speaking of who are. 